Hello, and welcome to this webinar, Contemplating Your Exit, a Legal Perspective. My name is Adam Petrikoff. I'm the managing partner of VR Business Brokers here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We work with business owners who are concerned about getting maximum dollars for their business when they are ready to exit. Today, we are joined by an excellent transaction attorney, Matt Joyner. Matt is a partner with Bishop, Delaney, Joyner, and Abner with offices in the South Park area. Our goal today is to inform and educate business owners and advisors about the things they should be thinking about before starting the sale process. As a business broker, I am amazed, amazed how few business owners have an attorney they regularly work with and trust. Specifically, when getting ready to sell their business, a transaction attorney is required to help them with their deal. Again, I am amazed at how many business owners use friends or other attorneys who are not specialists in transactions. That is a way to get a suboptimal outcome on your transaction. And remember, you only get one chance to sell your business. With this in mind, that is why we are here today, to learn more about the legal issues of a deal. So let's get started. Our guest today, Matt Joyner, uh, we could do the conventional way, but it's not conventional time, so let's do things a little differently. And Matt, okay. let's ask you a couple questions so people can understand a little bit more about you. Uh, okay. Where did you go to school, Matt? Well, I'm a Chapel Hill native who did not go to UNC except for kindergarten and bartending school. I uh, graduated from Chapel Hill High School and then went to Dartmouth College. And then after four years in the woods of New Hampshire, wanted to be in a city. So I went to University of Pennsylvania Law School for three years. And then it was time to come home. Nice, nice. And uh, what have you binge watched recently? Uh, I would say the only thing that you could say I've actually binge watched recently is Ozark. Great series uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of fun and very, uh, uh, very telling about sort of life on Southern Lake, um, taken to some wild extremes. So a lot of fun. Great. Favorite Charlotte restaurant? Ooh, okay, that's a toughie. Um, there's so many good ones. Uh, but I think we can say that as long as it has a picture of the Parthenon tape to the cash register and has banana pudding listed as a vegetable, I'm there. It's good. Nice. So, and finally, most important, a, a dear question to my heart. So you're done with dinner. Do you prefer an after dinner drink or dessert? Uh, I should go with dessert because I will have had some pre-dinner drinks and don't need an after dinner drink. Nice, nice. Okay, well, now we're done with that. Let's jump in. Matt, I'm going to let you uh, do your little uh, disclaimer here. Ah, very good. There we go. Yes, this being coming from an attorney it appropriately needs a disclaimer that what we're about to talk about here is not legal advice. Uh, and if you have legal issues that you need legal counsel on, uh, find a lawyer and I'd be happy to help. But uh, at this point, uh, we do not have an attorney-client relationship, which means, uh, wonderfully for me, that you can't hold me responsible for what I'm about to tell you. Uh, so, uh, so with that, uh, let's go. Well, let's jump in. So this is the overview of what we're going to talk about. Matt and I have broken this, uh, these topics down into five sections. And uh, so let's jump in. Matt, let's talk about some of these initial documents that come up as you, as a business owner, are starting to think about selling your business. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the uh, picture here is actually pretty apropos because um, business owners really need to understand that they are getting ready to be in a marathon, not a sprint. A lot of business owners just think, hey, once they make the decision to sell, then it just magically happens. And I think getting the mindset from the get-go that this is a process that is, you know, can take a long time and you just got to be sort of mentally geared up for the long haul. And uh, going into it, really sort of in reverse order in a way, um, contemplating 
due diligence process. You know, once you get into a deal, there's going to be a process of the buyer learning about your business, making sure they understand what's going on, they want to buy. And so uh, getting ready for that process is really critical. And similar to selling a house, uh, you know, most people at this time of life have sold, bought or sold at least one house. Few people have bought or sold one a business. A lot of it's the same in that uh, you don't just stick the sign out in front of your house when you decide to sell. You get a broker like Adam involved and they come in and they take a look, look and they say, okay, you know, here's what we think the price should be and here are the things I need you to fix or deal with before we take this thing to market. And it's a very similar sort of situation of uh, anticipating what you need to deal with, uh, what you need to tweak, uh, what you need to uh, collect before going to market. And from the attorney standpoint, you can always anticipate that the other, the buyer's gonna ask for copies of all your contracts. And so just gathering up your contracts, um, are there any licenses that the business has? Whoa, it's moved on. Um, those things you wanna gather, uh, looking forward to uh, then getting onto an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, because you know the broker like Adam or whoever's helping you sell is gonna want uh, clearly for whatever you know, information you give to be covered by a confidentiality agreement. So the buyer doesn't just go out there and uh, share all of your stuff all over the place. Ultimately getting to a letter of intent, uh, which is you know, from the buyer saying, okay, you know, given what we know now, here's how we think a deal will, uh, will turn out or, and uh, here's what we're ready to propose. It's not legally binding. Um, the fact that it's not legally binding though, doesn't mean you shouldn't take it very, very seriously and get help doing it. Um, there, I've definitely been involved in deals where they've either fallen apart or come close to falling apart because the parties did their own letters of intent, letter of intent beforehand, there were issues not addressed. They got into the deal. And once those issues start starting getting fleshed out, they realized, hey, you know, we really didn't understand that we were on the same page here of what we were doing. And then some ill will can creep in as to, wait a minute, that's not what you said in the letter of intent. Uh, you know, and so really doing a good job on the letter of intent to, uh, you know, uh, make sure there's no misunderstandings uh, later down the road that can kill the deal is really important. Um, well, that's a great point. And, and what we see, Matt, so often is buyers get excited about an opportunity and they don't even consult with their attorney. They go to Google and sellers are like, well, is it serious? Should I get my attorney involved? And so from our perspective, we, we, we always encourage people to get attorneys involved as early as possible. Getting that foundation on the LOI, the letter of intent, upfront is so important. Mm -hmm. You're really building uh, uh, communication and trust, starting with that initial document. And if oh. you're not doing it properly um, and getting your interest protected with an attorney, you're doing yourself a huge disservice that's going to cost you much more money and time in the end. Well, you know, the fact that it's not legally binding, okay, fine. But the sheer human nature is that once something has been reduced to writing and signed, it has moral weight, even if it's not legally enforceable. And so it gives somebody the club to beat you with later on if, you know, something changes, uh, you know, because they got it in writing. So by golly, uh, you're stuck with it. Uh, and, and let's sort of dig into due diligence a little bit. I get it's the most common question I ask. I know you, you get asked this all the time. Sellers owners can get scared. That means that they're going to get access to everything, at, and but yet the deal may not close. So from a legal perspective, uh, help people understand what is going to be required in due diligence. Sure. I mean, you know, the buyer is going to want to understand certainly all the financial uh, history and, and situation of the business. Yeah, one thing uh, to think about as a seller is that you, you're not going to have to give everything all at once. You know, uh, you can go in the process and say, you know, uh, yeah, you want to know our top 20 customers and their names and, and their, uh, you know, the amount sold, et cetera. Uh, you know, we may give you a redacted version of that earlier on, and we're not going to tell you actual identities until we get close to really thinking, okay, this is, this is going to, this is, you know, going to close. Likewise with meeting the employees. So often a buyer will say, oh, well, I want to come around your site and, 
you know, sort of kick the tires and meet people and whatnot. I was like, uh, that's really sensitive stuff. And you're not going to be able to get to do that until we get really close to closing, uh, if at all, uh, until after closing. Uh, you know, because, you know, the seller clearly doesn't want to jeopardize their business. But at the same time, uh, the buyer needs to know and feel comfortable. And there's, uh, you know, is the process is really about uh, building up the credibility of the seller. Uh, you know, the more forthcoming you can be about the business, its background, flaws and all. I mean, there, there are definitely problems with all businesses and uh, don't get caught trying to hide something because throughout this process, you're going to need the buyer to give you the benefit of the doubt when you tell them something. And so to the extent you have built up your credibility um, before that with good thorough disclosure, uh, you know, it just makes the process go so much easier. Um, you know, if the buyer has found out something about your business and they ask you about it and you, and you don't realize they found it out um, and you try to stall or evade or whatever, um, that tells them that they can't trust, trust you. And so it goes back to Adam's point about trust and credibility. And yeah. uh, you just sort of got to be prepared to, to pay attention to that. And one of the things I just want to add uh, for, for those who own a business, if you're signing a non-disclosure agreement with a buyer, that does not give them the unilateral right to ask for anything at any time on demand or they're just going to walk. Um, there are times to give out certain bits of information, Matt alluded to customers or employees or vendors. We typically don't, we anonymize all that stuff. Yeah. So that relaxes, um, you know, our clients, but they are going to need to be able to make appropriate decisions based on information they find in due diligence. Yeah. But there is a time and a place for that. Yeah. So and and financing from the buyer's side comes into play there as well. If the buyer is going to get an SBA loan, the SBA has got to sign off and they've got to know about the business. Um, right. And so there's a certain amount that's just necessarily going to have to come out if there's going to be money for the deal. Um, right. But that's also a demarcation point within the deal of saying, okay, there's some sensitive stuff that we're not going to give you until we see an actual commitment letter from a bank for financing. We know you've got the money. Uh, so that's sort of a, a, a good sort of uh, turning point in a deal as far as disclosing information. So as we get these sort of initial documents, NDAs, letter of intents, moving into due diligence, I just want to uh, invite anyone uh, to feel free to Put a question in the chat room and uh, we will address them at the end when we have some Q&A. But if you have anything that uh, you want to ask, uh, please feel free to put it there and, and we will address it. So let's move on to the, the, the next phase. Um, whoops, computer. There we go. There we go. Oh, back. Uh, the purchase agreement. <laughs> uh, there's a, a lot of people assume they're stock deals. Very few are. Uh, Matt, you want to talk about about everything that goes into the whole subject of purchase agreements. Sure. Um, you know, just briefly from the seller standpoint, uh, basically you can either sell the equity of the business entity itself, or you can sell the assets of the business. Um, and most deals are asset sales just because buyers are very leery of uh, getting all the liabilities automatically when they purchase the equity. Um, and so they'll want to do an asset deal. And, uh, you know, the, uh, really the only time you see an equity deal is when there's a really good reason for it. The, the business has a license that can't be transferred or some really important contracts that can't be assigned. Uh, and so think about that now here on the front end and just analyzing your business when it come time, comes time to sell. Do you have something that would justify, uh, you know, commanding an equity deal rather than an asset deal? Um, another sort of issue is this issue of closing and, you know, going into all of this process with the end in mind and the notion there is going to be a closing of this deal. And the question is, this is like a house sale where you get a contract first and then have a long period and then a closing later, or do you do it all at once? Uh, we call it sort of a, a sign and close deal where the documents are getting drafted, the diligence is getting done all at the same time. And then you have just one event, one closing where everything gets signed and the money changes hands. Um, from the seller's perspective on the asset purchase agreement, uh, getting sellers 
accustomed to the notion of representations and warranties. I found, you know, business people have no idea you know, what those are. They've never encountered them before. Uh, but from the seller's perspective, in a lot of ways, it's the most important thing in the document. And that really is your representation as a seller to the buyer of the, the, the facts of, of, the, of the business. Uh, you've paid all your taxes. You don't have environmental problems. You haven't had employee lawsuits. Uh, you know, really sort of where you sort of stick yourself out on here are the facts you can rely on in buying this business. And so getting the seller to really focus on uh, the wording, the exact wording of those representations and warranties uh, is really, really important. Something to be thinking of as you're going into it uh, because all this stuff that they see in diligence, uh, they're going to want to see me essentially verified by you or certified by you and your reps and warranties. And that's the thing that if something's not true, that's where they'll get you after the fact. And it's your lawyer's job to make sure that keep the target small so their opportunity to get you after the fact and, uh, is reduced, if not eliminated. So. so Matt, one of the most common questions we get asked all the time as we start talking with clients, they say, well, I have a couple cars in the business or I have uh, something else. Can I exclude the asset as part of the sale, I want to I want to keep my uh, my F two fifty truck and uh, talk a little bit about that as uh, from a seller's perspective. Sure, happens all the time that you know the seller you know they've got a laptop, they've got a truck, they've got some stuff they consider their personal property that you know cell phone been number been used. Cell phone number can get to be an issue. Actually, once had a deal literally almost come apart. Um, because the buyer assumed they were getting the World War II airplane prints in the seller's office uh, as part of the deal. And the seller said, no, that's personal stuff. And, you know, and, and it was just amazing how people were able to argue over that. And, and so one message to the sellers, as you're getting ready to sell your business, anything that really is of personal nature like that, get out of the office before you let them come take a tour so they don't even know it was there. So if you got a black Elvis portrait that you don't want to be thrown into the deal, just get it out of there before they see it. Um, but no, it's, it's completely normal to have a, a schedule on the APA uh, that is lists the excluded assets. And you know, you'll see in the APA frequently sort of, we come at things positively. Okay, what's the list of stuff that's included? And then we'll also, you know, help definite, define the issues by coming at it negatively. What's specifically not included? And it's perfectly normal um, to, to carve out certain things that you consider essentially personal or you want to continue using afterwards and not include in the deal. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next phase. Yeah. Um, seller issues. Yes, we ask this question up front and, and attorneys do and buyers do. It's typically the first question that anybody asks, why is the seller selling this business? So if you are getting ready to go out, um, because is usually not a very satisfactory answer to a buyer. So whether it's health or whether it's retirement or whether it's burnout, have a have a, a reason that really makes sense. And, and Matt, you can talk about that from a from a legal perspective. Sure. And you know, from the seller's perspective, uh, give some real thought uh, to what do you want your life to look like after the deal. Yeah, I mean, you get so much focus on the deal itself and, you know, getting to a closing, but really have some thought as to what do you want your life to look like? Do you want to just go off and play golf somewhere? Do you want to keep your hand in the industry you, in some sort of capacity, either in a trade group or, or what have you? Or, you know, are you interested in, you know, staying on and staying involved in the business to whatever extent, you know, maybe a lender will let you, SBA won't let you for longer than a year. But it becomes really important um, because the, uh, the buyer is gonna wanna get a non-compete agreement out of the seller. And uh, they're gonna wanna have some control over what you can and can't do after selling. Um, and so to the extent you have thought through what you really want, we can work that into the deal. Um, you know, I had a deal once where uh, the seller got in trouble because uh, 
it was a, a building supply business that he had sold and he's continued to dabble in the fringes of the industry in a way that the buyer you know sort of felt was a a violation of the non-compete when it really wasn't and it would have been good and, and we've done it several times if you have an idea of what you're interested in doing after the fact we'll you know spell that out in the non-compete and say specifically that for seller to be involved in these particular activities or with these particular parties will not violate the non-compete and just gets you know a lot of potential misunderstanding cleared up uh, on the front end um, so the question is what are you going to do after the sale are you going to be a consultant for the uh, the buyer and for how long? I mean, buyers typically, uh, a lot of them, if they're not familiar with the business, they come into it thinking, oh, we're gonna need you around to hold our hands for, for a year or more. Um, and then they get into it and after a few weeks, they realize, hey, we got this, we don't need you. <laughs> um, that's pretty typically the scenario. Um, so just working out with them, how you're gonna fit in, how the transition's gonna be, what is it, what is it, what is a, handoff uh, consists of in terms of introducing them to your customers, introducing them to suppliers, going to a trade show to introduce them around. Um, and so that's one aspect of relationship with the buyer. But another one to be aware of as you're going into it as a seller is that if the buyer is getting uh, financing in order to do the deal and you are also providing financing by way of a note, taking a note as part of the consideration, expect that you're going to be subordinated to the institutional lender. And that can be a really touchy flashpoint if the sellers don't understand that early on, that the payment of their note is going to be behind the payment of the institutional note. Because a lot of times sellers don't you know, want an all-cash deal, uh, makes sense, and grudgingly concede that, okay, we'll, we'll do some seller financing here. And so that becomes this contentious emotional issue that they're, that they're you know, uh, taking a note in the first place. And if they don't understand early on that when they take that note, uh, they're not necessarily first in line for payment, uh, that can be a problem. You know, that can be a really rude surprise after they've gone through the emotional trauma of agreeing to take a note. Um, so just another thing to be aware of on the front end while you're thinking about selling your business, and that gets into your working with Adam of, you know, do we provide any seller financing? Do we insist on a cash only deal? Um, and just sort of how do we fit into this whole process of payment as a subordinated creditor after the fact? And I know Adam, you work with your clients very closely on just how to price it and, and how to structure it and what they can expect in terms of, of providing some seller financing. Well, and, and we, we, we let the data speak for itself. I mean, 90% of deals under $10 million have an element of some seller financing. It might be a short amount. It might be, you know, multiple years with interest. Um, but we try to educate sellers that seller financing almost always is part of the deal. Um, it's, it's, it's rare that it's not. And so, um, you know, to Matt's point, recognizing that you will be second in line, um, but it gives the buyer greater confidence that they're going to buy this business knowing that you're taking some form of a note, even if it's small or just for 12 months. Uh, it really does yeah. help bring buyers and sellers together. So let's move yeah. on, Matt, to the, uh, to the third party issues. You know, I, the way I like to talk about this is Okay, so we've got the documents working, the buyers and sellers getting along, hopefully the broker's moving things along, the attorneys are getting along, everything's doing great. And then all of a sudden these third party folks show up. And- uh, Consider them the in-laws in the deal. The in-laws, I mean, you can get the buyers and sellers really uh, sort of becoming closer when they deal with some of these third party issues because- yeah. You know, in landlords, the buyer and seller just wants to get this done, and the landlord may be being a bit unreasonable. So, talk a little bit about some of these third parties that uh, get involved in these deals. Sure, sure. Um, something for sellers to think about on the front end as they're contemplating selling your businesses is okay, not only do we pull together all of our internal documentation these people are going to see, but let's sit here and think through who are the people or the parties that are going to have to go along with this. And so who are the people who can throw a monkey wrench into the deal? Because as Adam says, we frequently have the situation of the buyer and the seller doing great with each other, negotiating their deal and agreeing, and then having some outsider uh, 
sort of mess things up. And so typically you've got landlords, uh, if you've got a lease uh, property, you know, during uh, recession, bad times, landlords are happy to have paying tenants take over leases. Well, now that the, the real estate market has gotten tight, um, you know, landlords can take the opportunity to force a whole new lease negotiation and really mess up a deal uh, for a buyer to realize, wait, wait a minute, they're going to have much greater lease expense than they understood that the seller had had. Um, another issue is franchisors. If you're buying a franchise business, the franchisor is going to be very involved in uh, vetting the documents you negotiate. Uh, they vary in terms of degree of involvement and they really vary in degree of competence in even understanding their own processes under their franchise agreement of how the transition takes place and uh, how that all works. But you know, be in touch with, you know, if there's a franchisor in the in scene, make sure that they're uh, involved early on and aren't going to cause a problem at the last minute saying they want to exercise their right of first refusal under the franchise agreement after you've gone through all this trouble to negotiate a deal. Um, a Probably the biggest uh, third party to really keep your eye on is the lender. Um, and particularly, you know, if, if the buyer is getting an SBA loan, uh, you will have uh, not only the SBA bank, but you'll have their counsel involved. And I've seen a real trend just in the last, well, just within this year, really, of uh, the SBA uh, lenders counsel really getting involved in the, the business terms of the deal in ways that they really hadn't in the past. Uh, in the past, it was, okay, if this business is good, it's going to pay, you know, down this debt, fine, the bank's fine with it. And, you know, the, the, the lender's counsel sort of went over things just to make sure, okay, uh, everything's basically in order here. I've had some deals where uh, lender's counsel is now starting to get involved in uh, terms that they, <laughs> they wouldn't have in the past. And I don't really know what's driving that. Um, but uh, it, as Adam says, it's frequently the case where uh, the buyer and the seller are uh, sort of allied in their war on the common enemy, the, uh, the lender, and getting action out of the lender, getting turnaround, getting them just, you know, to get with the program and get the deal done. Um, another party that's out there to deal with is state licensors, the DMV. If you're going to have vehicles involved in your, your deal, um, know where the certificates of title are, <laughs> locate them in advance, um, but also sort of work out with the buyer, okay, how are we gonna deal with the transition of these titles? Am I gonna go with you to the DMV office from the closing to get these things handed over? Uh, rather than getting to the closing table and have the you know, seller go, oh my gosh, you know, I don't know where those titles are. And then uh, everybody scrambles around and, uh, yeah, you know, not good. So again, it's so true, man. Of being prepared. <laughs> yeah, there's such an alphabet soup of, of terms. There's an NDA, there's an LOI, there's an APA, which is the Asset Purchase Agreement. And we uh, attorneys, brokers really try to educate people about what is coming next so they're not surprised. And we get to the closing table and we say the words DMV and people <laughs> freak out. Uh, for some reason, the DMV just just gets a nerve in everybody, and we always counsel people, bring your titles to a close and go directly from the close to the DMV. And when we tell them that, they, 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 it's like we've you know, shot their, their, their puppy. Uh, no one wants to go to the DMV, but this is a great third-party issue that you just got to communicate about. Yeah. And um, before we slide into the last one, we're starting to get a, a, a couple uh, – uh, questions. Uh, I, I inadvertently told people to put it in the chat. Uh, you can put it in the, the, the Q&A section oh. as well. We'll get them both. we got one more slide here and then I promise you, uh, Chris and Tom, we will uh, addre address your, your questions here. But let's, let's move on to this uh, last slide here. And talk really about closing. And look, uh, closings have, have changed over the years. Uh, the, the, the big Everybody in one conference room, uh, 
doesn't exist as much, although to be perfectly candid, I'm a little old school on uh, some deals. It's really important, I think, symbolically to, uh, if, if you can, uh, get together and have sort of a, a momentous handshake and passing the keys. Um, but with technology today, so much is done remote where one, yep. the buyers will be with their attorney and the sellers will be with their attorney. From a legal perspective, Matt, talk a little bit about what's going on in the closing and with the documents at close. Yeah, um, so it's the big event. And, and one of the most important things from the lawyer standpoint is for everybody to realize that a closing is just a signing ceremony. It is not a, uh, gee, let's start reading these documents for the first time ceremony. Uh, had that happen and just had to call the whole thing off when somebody had sort of been a, a, a minor player, you know, showed up at closing and, you know, started wanting, wanting to begin reading documents. Like, no, that's not what we're doing here. Uh, we're in and out of here getting things signed, getting money moved, and shaking hands and uh, getting on. And uh, so it's a closing ceremony. It's not a negotiation session. Um, there will be yet some more documents there. One of the most import important things, the closing statement. If you ever sold a house, there's a HUD statement that shows the flow of funds. Well, you'll have a closing statement in this deal as well, showing the flow of funds in and out and who's getting paid. Uh, and that's a really important document. Uh, right up there with the uh, APA. There'll be a bill of sale, which is the actual document that legally transfers title. Um, I had a situation once where the buyer who was sort of representing themselves because uh, they knew so much, um, we got to that and said, oh no, we don't need a bill of sale. That's just another, you know, in, unimportant document. I thought, okay, fine. You know, if you really don't want to have proof of your legal title, these assets you're buying, that's on you. Um, so there will be those additional documents. Uh, as we say, closing is time for money to change hands. And, uh, you know, the way to do it is by wire because wired funds are immediately available. A lot of times I'll have seller clients and they will have had informal discussions with the buyer saying, oh yeah, you know, we'll, we'll take a check, you know, a bank check or something like that. And I have to go back and say, oh, no, um, you know, we you know, put into the LOI for a reason that funds will be by wire. And why is that? Uh, you know, as a seller, you may be comfortable with the check that you get from the buyer and it may be on a perfectly good bank um, as a bank check. But the fact of the matter is when you take that to deposit in your account, your bank is gonna put a hold on it. And I had a situation before of a seller who took a certified check from Mellon Bank, a really good bank uh, for the sale of his assets took it to his bank deposit and they put a hold on it for over two weeks. And I mean, he had already had plans for that money. And so the closing itself went great, but his problem was with his own bank. So, you know, wired funds are immediately available. Uh, so, you know, we don't like to deal in checks, but wires sometimes intimidate people because they haven't done them before, but they're really easy. And if you, you know, just talk with your banker and get your wiring instructions and, uh, you know, banks know how to do this. Um, so don't just default to saying you'll accept a check because that's what you're comfortable with handling yourself. Um, you really don't want to do that from a seller's perspective. You want to be able to get your hands on that money immediately. Um, so, uh, I always, it's not on here, but I always say it's really important, uh, to celebrate when you're done. Uh, this is, this is a big deal. And, um, it's really important to acknowledge it, to go out and have celebration. And uh, um, it's, it's symbolically very important. Um, Matt, we've gone through a lot of these stages really quickly. Uh, there's a couple of questions I wanna, I wanna uh, make sure we address and answer, um, but, uh, and also encourage you to, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section and, and we'll address them. The first topic was about seller financing and whether or not that is secured. Um, I have my position, I'll, uh, I'll give mine, and then um, you, know, you from a legal perspective. Seller financing is what, I, I call it sort of the boogeyman of a deal for a seller. They have heard every horror story from anybody that's ever sold a deal. And when you peel back the onion and really start to learn um, what happened in the deal, you realize the seller did not get the seller financing note secured. For us, it's required. We will not allow a buyer to put 
in an offer without a personal guarantee for the seller financing. Right. And so we make that very upfront. Now it can be negotiated and what does that mean exactly? But from, from our perspective, from a, a broker's perspective, yes, you should get a personal guarantee. Matt, from yeah. a legal side. Absolutely, you, you went right to it. Um, you know, yes, seller notes should be secured and yes, they should be secured by personal guarantees rather than a lien on some assets that you just sold that the bank already has a lien on. Um, but you know the beauty of the personal guarantee uh, when the note is from the buying entity corporation or LLC, so be it. Um, when the individual owner of that entity has to personally guarantee, uh, you know their company's note, you know that they have to take this seriously, and you have that additional emotional comfort that you know if you know they try to stiff you on the note you're coming after them individually. Um, and along those lines, not just personal guarantee, but you want a personal guarantee from both the shareholder owner of the buyer entity and their spouse. Correct. Um, so, you know, getting up front in the LOI or wherever that, you know, the notes can be secured by personal guarantees of the shareholders and their spouses. And why do we emphasize that? Um, in the state of North Carolina, uh, if you own real estate uh, with your spouse, you own it by what we call tenancy by the entireties, which means that neither one of you owns uh, half of the property, but the marital union owns the property. And what that means is the uh, creditors of one spouse only can't foreclose on their residence because they don't own that residence or half of it. But if the the creditor, the seller in this case, going after them on the personal guarantee, has a judgment against both the stockholder and their spouse, then you can foreclose on their house. And uh, that gives you a lot more comfort that not only are you going to be able to come after the seller individually, but you're able to threaten the home if they, uh, if they try to uh, not pay on the note. And uh, that just gives you that much more comfort as a seller that, okay, you're going to have to deal with this lender out there that you're subordinated to, but at the end of the day, you got both uh, the the individual and their spouse on the hook, and that's a very real threat on where they live, and you can expect them to take that really seriously. And it's uh, it's a great way for us to ferret out if the buyer is serious or not. If they're not willing to put in a personal guarantee on their their offer, we don't we don't submit it to the seller. We make yeah. the seller aware of it, but it, it's not going to go forward. Uh, moving on, we got a couple questions here. Uh, Chris has asked about working capital, and uh, you know he's heard that uh, it can be a real point of disagreement. And the question is, can you touch on what you typically see in terms of establishing a, a private equity group to keep a certain level of working capital in the company, or if working capital is removed and the buyer is expected to get a line of credit to cover the working capital? So let me answer that in two ways. Uh, first of all, it really depends on the size of the deal. Smaller deals, when I'm gonna say smaller, uh, purchase price of typically, let's call it five, six, seven million and under. Um, let's just use five million. Those are typically done on a cash-free, debt-free basis. And what that means is that, yes, the, buy, the borrower will be getting uh, working capital and or a line of credit to make sure that, uh, because the seller is taking out the accounts receivable, the accounts payable and all cash in the bank. As you get into larger businesses, let's say seven, 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars, yes, working capital is a whole nother negotiation unto itself. So, and that is typically very clearly spelled out in the letter of intent. And it should be spelled out in a letter of intent, sort of the framework for the discussion. Uh, so yes, you can agree on a purchase price and, and put the working capital discussion in the bullpen as you get further into the documents as part of the purchase agreement. But right. absolutely, yes, there will be another negotiation on working capital. And At that point, typically, 
we, as a, as, a, as a broker and intermediary, we provide some analysis. We encourage you to include your CPA and or your internal CFO, and it, but it is a discussion and um, it doesn't usually get heated, but it, it certainly can. Matt, any comments No, there? people never argue over money, Adam. What are you talking about? Um, that's why this next last bullet here on this screen, post-closing true up, uh, sort of touches on that issue of, uh, okay, there's been negotiation of the working capital and it'll vary from business to business. You know, if, if there's inventory, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, a, you know, immediately before closing a, a, an inventory of what's there and, and there's been, you know, expectation set as about what level or value of inventory needs to be on hand at turnover. Um, if there are accounts out there uh, to, or, 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 or work in process, say it's a, uh, a uh, commercial plumbing business that's being sold. And at the time of sale, there are a number of different projects that are ongoing and there's argument over, okay, how much of the proceeds of that come to the seller and how much go to the buyer, what's left to perform. Uh, so, you know, that whole issue of, you know, what is in the business at the time we get it uh, is very much something, as Adam says, needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. But for the purposes of today and being a seller, what you should be thinking about now is just really thinking through where in your business are there items that uh, will be, will straddle a closing um, in terms of the value of the business and sort of parsing out who gets what and what sort of working capital needs to be in the business at the time and, uh, you know, and how that fits into your, you know, your pricing with Adam or whoever uh, of, yeah. of the purchase price. And next question uh, from, from Chris Jones, uh, and thank you for the softball. Uh, any insight into the current state of small business M&A market, especially in Charlotte, would be much appreciated. So the short answer is it depends. The more qualified answer would be there is a tremendous amount of activity right now. August and September were probably two of the busiest months that we have seen in years, partly because there were some SBA incentives and we are still seeing plenty of activity because of the election. Some people are really trying to get things done by 1230 this year. And by the way, if you haven't started, it's probably too late to get it done before this year. But there are a lot of transactions that are going to be done over the next eight weeks, uh, notwithstanding the election. Um, so let me peel that back a little further. Good businesses, excuse me, businesses that have performed well or good or at or slightly above what they did pre-COVID are having very little problem selling their businesses. If their financials are in good shape, they are getting full price or near full price if it has not been impaired due to the pandemic. Opposite end is if it is really impaired, if you're down 40, 50 percent, there is virtually no market for your business right now. Um, so what we're counseling people to do is, well, you can sell it, but you will get 40 to 50 percent what you could get. What we're counseling people to do is do the best they can to get through this year into next year. The banks are looking for continued improvement. So if you're going up little by little each month and getting back to where you were 12 months ago, the banks are being pretty reasonable and flexible. So, if you, so to summarize, if your business is in relatively good shape or, or doing very well, uh, the market is very, very robust, very robust. There's so much money. There's so many buyers. Our buyer activity is near record high, as are other folks in this industry, because we talk to, to people. Um, there are plenty of transactions getting done. Private equity is, is really buying and trying to get things done before the end of the year. Um, I anticipate 
you know, more sellers coming to market probably by, you know, March, April, when they start to look at their tax returns. And what we're hearing from people is this year has been like three years. I just want to get through this year. Let's talk in the spring and let's get this on the market so we can be done by the end of next year. We're hearing that a lot. And there are plenty, plenty of buyers out there. Matt, I know you and I talk all the time. I know you've been really busy. Anything you want to share about this, about the, the M&A market? Yeah, I, I had a very busy summer. Um, and thankfully, it, it, it was it's sort of surprising. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, you know, in, in Charlotte is a town that I think, and Madam, you can speak to this, has lots of buyers in it to start off with. You know, the banks bring people here from all over. They like living here and they realize when they leave the bank, they're going to have to do something else. So they want to buy a business. And uh, so, you know, you've got a lot of people here in town that are always sort of thinking about, oh, okay, my exit strategy from the bank is to buy my own business, start my own business, whatever. Um, and uh, so there's sort of a robust sort of built in market, even in bad times here. And frankly, <laughs> During the big recession, that uh, was even sort of a bigger buyer's market because there are a lot of out-of-work bankers with severance money looking to go set up their own thing so they never have to, you know, be canned by a bank again. So uh, we're very, very fortunate here in Charlotte in this area to have some built-in economic drivers, uh, you know, that can benefit sellers. And Adam, I don't know if you have any feelings about geographic location of sellers and, you know, what do you consider the Charlotte market? You know, it's not just Mecklenburg County, but, you know, Hickory, Statesville, Monroe, uh, you know, sort of surrounding metro area and getting some of these Charlotte-centric buyers accustomed to the notion of doing a deal in Salisbury or, you know, someplace that they might not be real familiar with. Well, the data is pretty pretty overwhelming. The, on, on small to medium-sized businesses under, say, $10 million, um, the buyers typically, about 90% of the time, come within 25 miles of the business. Um, we, Matt and I actually worked on a deal earlier this year where that was the except. We had an exception. We had someone move from, from Georgia to Charlotte, mainly because they wanted to be in Charlotte. And so they happen to find a business, but uh, the whole, I, I see the analytics. Um, we see that people are, are hitting on our website uh, from outside of this area, people wanting to move down here. It happened after the recession. It happened after 9-11. The greater uh, Charlotte, North, South Carolina area is going to continue to have influx of people um, because it's an attractive place to live. We're near the water. We're near the mountains. All the reasons that we all live here. Um, I assure you we're getting inquiries because I see them from people outside of this area wanting to move here. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, and sort of along those lines, going back to the original analogy to residential real estate sales. I mean, who knew that during COVID, the Charlotte residential market would still just be booming right along and that people would buy houses without ever visiting them, just looking at them online. Right, right. It, it hasn't stopped the sale of houses and there's as robust a demand for housing in Charlotte as there's ever been. And it hadn't stopped the demand for businesses. So and I'll, I'll just add one more thing about businesses that are selling right now. Um, like I said, there's a lot of buyers out there, so they have choices and they are choosing the businesses that have their house in order, that have their financials that are clear and easy to understand where the P&Ls match the tax returns. They are working with people that have, that make sure that they have a good team in place and that they have infrastructure and that they're not necessarily, that the owner is, is just the business. Um, so yes, there are a lot of opportunities in this market. We think it'll continue to be strong. It is, um, it is not maybe as um, prolific in terms of how many businesses are coming to market right now. Cause like I said, sellers are a little cautious. We do anticipate by second quarter next year, um, it will be very strong, um, uh, and, and, you know, get some equilibrium back. So I don't see there's any more questions, Matt. 
this has been great. Hopefully those of you who have been on this webinar have enjoyed the educational material. We will make this available for everybody uh, to watch again if you uh, are so inclined or forward it to someone else. We greatly appreciate your time. And um, if you have, whoops, if you have any final questions, uh, here is our contact information again. Uh, you can just Google either one of us. Uh, we try to make this more of an educational as opposed to self-promotion, but there may be someone out there that wants to get in touch with us. Uh, we're happy to, to talk with you. Matt, this was fun. Let's do All it right. again. And Adam, uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, for everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. All right. Bye now. Thanks.